is uh, Christopher Atwood. I'm a professor in Mongolian and Chinese frontier and ethnic history at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm here in Mongolia for this rather short trip uh, to receive an honorary doctorate uh, from the uh, National University of Mongolia, or Mongol Scenic Circle uh, Voice, as it's generally referred to in Mongolia. It's a very interesting. I have done a number of interviews connected with this, uh, but one of, the, one of the interviewers pointed out that this is actually the 30th anniversary of the first time in which I walked on the campus of Mongolia National University. In 1989, I came to Mongolia uh, for the first time uh, as part of the Young Mongolist Summer School, uh, which is a great, uh, a great institution. I really encourage anybody who's thinking of going into Mongolian studies and kind of humanistic or social science to uh, get involved with that uh, summer school program. It's still going on, um, and usually the costs in Mongolia are are covered by the government. Anyway, in 1989, I did that, and I went into the Mongolian National University where the various classes were being held, and uh, it was really a great time, and uh, it's very interesting to do the whole kind of cohort of people who did that with me at the time, many of whom are relatively noted people in Mongolian studies uh, to this day. Um, but, so 30 years later, um, and I'm very humbled to receive a recognition of my work in the form of an honorary doctorate. Um, along with uh, other such notables, mostly, mostly it's uh, political figures such as Tito, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, the Dalai Lama, uh, and <laughs> uh, what, but the other, the other Mongolist who received it was uh, uh, Dame Carolyn Humphrey uh, of, of Cambridge. I've kind of bounced around in terms of periods. Um, I think there is some kind of coherence to the uh, sorts of topics that I'm interested in. But when I first, uh, uh, I first got interested in Mongolia after taking a class on the Mongol World Empire, um, and it was really interesting. We um, worked with sources, uh, original sources, and what I realized at that time that Mongolian, the history of Mongolia is very much connected to world history in a way that uh, maybe in some other countries with sort of that are more sort of focused domestically, like say China, not, not so much the case. So. Um, but in the end, I decided, uh, I then spent two years in Inner Mongolia, actually, from 1986 to 1988. At that point, I conceived the idea of studying uh, the nationalist movements in Inner Mongolia in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and so that led, actually, interesting enough, that led to research here in Ulaanbaatar, because um, studying the nationalist movements, basically movements of secession from China and merger with Mongolia was not something that would be really possible in China, at least in the 1990s or 1980s. Um, so uh, I came here and worked in the uh, archives in um, what was then the party archives and the archives of the Mongolian People's Republic um, in, in the Mongol last months of the Mongolian People's Republic. Um, and uh, so I got a lot of uh, information about that, about these people who were sending letters to Ulaanbaatar to say, we'd like to join with Mongolia, we want your support. Um, it's a little, you know, letters home, um, you know, mom, send money. Uh, this, is, this was, they didn't want to send money. They said, you know, <laughs> uh, mothership organization, send money, send guns. Uh, we want to make a revolution in Mongolia. <laughs> so they did that, and um, it's kind of sort of a tragic story because it didn't really happen. Um, although it had more influence than, than people than people realized. That, that led to my first book, that was my dissertation at Indiana University in 1994, and then I, uh, my, my first book. So since then, uh, I've done some more, I did some more work on aspects of modern Mongolia, but since then, I began teaching about um, uh, Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan. So later on, I, my research went back to that, which originally when I was an undergraduate was what first got me involved in the Mongol Empire, in the Mongolian studies. So now I'm working with, um, uh, I've uh, done some, uh, finished a big project on a, uh, a source uh, that was uh, on, uh, on uh, Chinggis Khan. And I'm now working on a series of articles which I think will probably f feed into a book on um, looking at the, uh, uh, the Yuan Dynasty, that is to say the, 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 well, the Mongol Empire and the Yuan Dynasty as a whole, from a kind of political economy point of view. Uh, and so uh, I hope that this will be given new light on the Mongol Empire. And, and I guess the, the perspective I'd like to sort of raise is that it, in some ways it's really, it's a very modern looking empire. I mean, maybe not modern in the sense of say, the empire of say like, you know, uh, Bill Gates, but modern in the sense of maybe the empire of, of Hernan Cortes, um, you know, the sort of European colonial empires in many ways. The Mongol empire was organized 
in some ways had strikingly similar effects. Uh, ACMS have been a lot, had a lot of great um, uh, collaboration with ACMS. Um, one of the most important things is the ACMS runs a wonderful uh, Mongolian language program, which I've been um, uh, sending students. I've got one coming coming to the ACMS this summer. Uh, the ACMS has been very helpful. Um, I, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania, which I've where I've been at for three years, we had a program with the um, uh, and still going on with the Lauder Institute, um, which is a kind of business international relations MBA, and I took people to Mongolia, and the ACMS uh, uh, has been uh, instrumental in organizing all kinds of great events for the students. Um, and I'll be doing that uh, actually again this summer, but with an undergraduate, not this summer, this spring of 2020, but with an undergraduate group. Um, so that's also something I'm hoping the ACMS, and I'm, I'm quite confident the ACMS will be able to help uh, make that a really great successful experience as well. Uh, so that's, um, and the ACMS has also been running field schools and other things, and so I'm hoping that I'll be able to get lots of undergraduates who've been here for a week and maybe talked a little bit about the ACMS, and then they'll want to come back and do the field school and do con all kinds of other things. So uh, the ACMS has really been a, a, a great institution uh, for helping in a diverse range of people, not just... I mean, I, I'm someone who's, I think, see myself as being in Mongolian studies and Mongolian language is very important to that, but of course, uh, the ACMS is also, and I was uh, really surprised to find there's a lot of people at, um, at places like the University of Pennsylvania that I had no knowledge of who were doing biology, geology, uh, design, all kinds of other things, and working in Mongolia, the ACMS is very important to helping them get sort of uh, established and uh, move forward on that. Well, first of all, let me just say it's it's a great place to do research um, compared to other environments or other places you could be doing research in, let's say, broadly speaking, within Asia. I think it's mm -hmm. probably one of the most open, if not the most open. I mean, I don't know if um, uh, researching, say, in Japan would have a similar degree of... of lack of ideological controls and things like that. Um, but it may have the same, but it can, I, it can hardly have more, um, uh, more freedom than Mongolia in that terms. And of course, compared to uh, China, Russia, uh, and, and many of the countries, Southeast Asia, of course, it's, um, it's tremendous. So uh, really, I would say particularly people doing history, um, yeah, just uh, go for it. That would be the first advice. Uh, I would also say, um, and this is again the you know for people who are doing biology or geology or their scientific fields this may be not so important but for people doing um, humanities social science really uh, try to make an effort to uh, uh, get a good grasp of language early on and the ACMS programs are very helpful for that um, there's other other uh, programs out there as well if you're working on anything before 1950 um, it's also useful the Mongol bitchik, the vertical script, is, is important. That's one of, one of the frust a little bit frustrating things about Mongolia is that they have these two scripts, and really you can't ignore either of them, because one of them is like what all the scholars in Mongolia are, work are working on, the Cyrillic script, and then one of them is a vertical script. Um, there's lots of great topics, but there's, it's such a, you could say, to use a military metaphor, it's a target-rich environment. Uh, there's a lot of great topics that have never been studied, um, at least not, never been studied by, um, by someone writing in the Western academic tradition, which is somewhat different from uh, that in Mongolia. Of course, naturally speaking, in Mongolia, they never ask why should you study the 1921 revolution. It's just it's our revolution. It's of course it's important. Uh, but if you're studying from the Western point of view, um, the question of well, why is this important in terms of world history, or why what we can we learn from this? That has a take-home significance um, uh, outside of Mongolia. That kind of question leads to you asking things in somewhat different ways. So there's a lot of topics that have not been studied. One thing I really want to emphasize um, is that um, Mongolia, uh, the archives in Mongolia um, have the, what I would say is the largest, I, 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 I really, I can't think of any even remotely close rival, is the largest archive of a traditionally nomadic society kept in that traditionally nomadic society's own language in the world by many factors of 10. Uh, if you do research on nomadism in Kazakhstan, you're reading about Russians writing about Kazakhs up until maybe even the uh, 21st century. If you're reading about, um, uh, if you're reading about 
um, say, nomads in Somalia, well, there's not really a whole lot of archives until the Italians get there and they start doing their colonial thing, uh, their colonial archives in, in Somalia and so on. But in Mongolia, even though Mongolia was ruled by the, the Qing dynasty, the system they were using to rule Mongolia was basically an indigenous system. And the language, more importantly, the language that local administration was carried on was entirely by staffed by Mongols writing in Mongolian. So there's all kinds of subjects um, that are really very important. There's also a lot of other really interesting topics for modern Mongolian history that are not um, at all uh, covered or not at all um, studied. Just thinking of a few um, uh, the people, so many topics we can think of. For example, one big topic in, in Western uh, history and history of worldwide is labor movements and, and the creation of a working class of uh, people who are used to working with machines. Um, and in Mongolia, that happened from the 40s, um, 30s and 40s onwards. 1934 was the first um, uh, Ajul Turin Kombina, the first industrial factory, the light industrial factory. And then a working class developed and eventually kind of replaced the foreign working class, mostly Chinese and Russians. But then something really funny happened in 1990, 1991 with the transition. This working class went through, well, kind of disappeared. Uh, and a lot of the organizations that uh, the unions and other organizations that it happened with it just sort of went into dispute. But then it got sort of reconfigured into a totally new economy. So it's a really interesting study of, you could call the making and unmaking of the Mongolian working class. Another possible topic is um, women. Uh, one thing I have to say for Inner Asia is that um, historically, the history of Central or Inner Asia is, um, uh, there's not a whole lot of women's history. Uh, and that is something that really, in terms of fully understanding uh, the Mongolian and inter Asian historical experience, is a tremendous big gap, a uh, real problem. Um, so there's all kinds of interesting places where you could start. Um, uh, for example, there's a really interesting uh, Mongolian writer. She became the sort of the Mongolia's post-war main woman writer, Sulpt. Uh, and so... It would be really interesting to study her life and how she rose to the top of the writers' union, uh, became a very influential figure um, in it. Um, the, again, looking at her in terms of how did her gender influence uh, her um, writing, and what does that say about gender in socialist Mongolia, uh, and then all kinds of changes that have been happening uh, since then. Lots of uh, uh, demographics, lots of demographic topics. Uh, again, we have this traditional nomadic population. Is there a particular demography of a nomadic population uh, in terms of, say, um, a number of children, uh, survival rates, things like that? That's a really interesting topic. Somebody who has some good demographic skills and also wants to learn a little simple Mongolia because the census forms are all pretty much the same. They're, they're, they're just forms. They're pretty easy to figure out. And work in Mongolia could have a really lot of, um, uh, maybe some very interesting uh, research results. Lots and lots more I could talk all day, uh, but uh, I really encourage people who are interested to working in Mongolia to just see that it's a wide open, a unique research environment that is wide open for all kinds of things. And again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to talk about what you could do in terms of, say, wildlife biology or archaeology. Again, it's really wide open for archaeology. So many things to do in Mongolia. It's great.